They are the two computer whiz kids who changed the world as we know it. Larry and Sergey always had this kind of irreverence as part of their attitude, which is what made them so creative. They had the same vision to organize all of the world's information and make it available to every one of us through the power of technology. They wanted to build, you know, the world's greatest search engine. We want to do this. We're not going to sell out. But to an ever increasing number of people, Google's access to their users' information is frightening. Google knows a lot more about us than we know about them. Do you know how Google's using all the information it collects on you? In a sense, they're the big brother that we've been talking about all these years. And they've seen their company's idealistic slogan "Don't be evil" used against them. They've always enjoyed feeling like the underdog, feeling like the evil empire was Microsoft. And now they've discovered that some people think they're the evil empire. These two founders really think of themselves as noblemen. They think that what they're doing is good for the world. Larry Page and Sergey Brin were the kind of guys who kept Bill Gates up at night. Journalist Ken Oletta. I said, Mr. Gates, what is your nightmare? And I thought he would say Apple or Netscape or Oracle. And he said, I'll tell you what I worry about. I worry about some guy in a garage inventing a new technology Microsoft has never thought about. Well, in '98, two guys were in a garage, and they hand let it sign, and it said Google Worldwide Headquarters. Larry Page, CEO, Sergey Brin, President. In an industry where innovation is just part of the job description, Larry Page and Sergey Brin have become virtual masters of the universe of information gathering. Their creation is part of our language, our daily routine. What we don't know. We Google six hundred twenty-nine thousand results. Wow! And all this time, I thought googling yourself meant the other thing. Not anymore. But most of us don't understand how it works, or how Google has managed to consistently stay ahead of its closest competitors. Silicon Valley is littered with startups that have stalled out. Why these two computer science geeks succeeded? May have a lot to do with the nearly parallel lives they led before creating together one of the world's largest and most powerful companies. Brin and Page respectfully declined to participate in this program. Sergey Brin was born in the Soviet Union in 1973. His parents were mathematicians and Jewish, which limited their career opportunities. Mark Malseed is the co-author of the Google Story. So Sergey's father went to a conference in Warsaw, met a whole bunch of colleagues from the West, saw what life was like outside the Soviet Union, came back, sat the family down, and said, "We have to leave." His parents brought with them a sense of purpose they instilled in their son. It boiled down to a simple message: Don't come back with a B. Don't come back with the second place award. Make it first. Always, and Sergey internalized this, and it did form a core part of his personality. Like Brin, Larry Page was born in 1973. His family lived in Michigan, and his father was the first person in his family to get a college degree. Both of his parents were in similar fields as Brin's. They were the second generation computer science, which at that time was very unusual because computer science was really only developing as a field in the 60s. And here, both of their parents were advanced degrees. Elliot Soloway is a computer science professor at the University of Michigan, where Larry was an undergraduate. Larry was willing to take a risk. It wasn't about the grade. He didn't care about the grade. He wanted to do something in technology and build something different. He doesn't give up. He goes at something and he sticks with it. That's really exciting to work with a student like that because they're willing to take a risk, they're willing to take a chance, and they're willing to put themselves out. Clearly, coming from homes where the parents talked about ideas and pushed their kids to study, to think outside the box, they see themselves as on a mission, and that mission. It really does spring from their biographies. 
In 2009, Page shared that mission with the graduating class at the University of Michigan. You know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night with a vivid dream? And you know how if you don't have a pencil and pad by the bed, it will be completely gone by the next morning. I had one of those dreams when I was 23. When I suddenly woke up, I was thinking, what if we could download the whole web and just keep the links, and I grabbed a pen and started writing. Soon after, I told my advisor, Terry Winograd, it would take a couple of weeks for me to download the web. He nodded knowingly, fully aware it would take much longer, but wise enough not to tell me. Stanford professor and engineering consultant to Google, Terry Winograd. Larry just thinks of ways of doing things that you might not expect. Sergey was a lot like Larry. He also was someone who really wanted to think outside the box, to say, if that sounds like it's impossible, let's try it. It was 1995 at Stanford University when the headstrong overachievers first met. Sparks flew. They each thought the other person arrogant, strong-willed, but that's actually formed the basis of a friendship. Sergey is the more affable of the two. He has a more outgoing personality than Larry. Larry tends to look at the floor while he talks. One of their Stanford professors used to say, well, the difference between the two of them was that Sergey would just burst into my office without asking. Larry would knock and then burst in. Page had an audacious dream to download the entire web. Brin's was similar. Sergey's big interest was in taking all the pages on the World Wide Web and trying to make sense of it, trying to find patterns. In the 90s, searching the Internet was rudimentary, hit or miss, often returning results that were useless. If you typed in the search uh, Alta Vista into Alta Vista, it couldn't find itself. Or misleading. A search for rental cars would turn up papers about the business of car rentals. And the process was very slow. So you typed in your query. You did something else while you waited for it to get the results. Then you went back and looked at the results, and most of them were completely irrelevant. Page and Bryn pushed for something better. The computer science professors thought he was crazy. Using Page's downloaded web, the two young engineers proved them wrong. By creating this large data set, Larry and Sergey were, you know, all of a sudden able to run all kinds of experiments, look for patterns, find, uh, ultimately, a better way to search. They started to do a uh, record of backlinks, they called them. Page noticed that behind every web page, there were hundreds or even thousands of other pages that linked to it. It was a eureka moment that would change the so-called information age. Then they realized that that list of backlinks could be used for ranking. If you have more backlinks, it showed you were a better page. If a lot of other websites linked to a web page, that probably meant users thought it was good. So the genius was in recognizing that this kind of algorithm could give you the kind of results that mattered the most to searchers. Page and Bryn had their secret formula. Now it needed a name. The guys were looking for a great name that was going to capture the grandiose vision that they had and hit upon this giant number, one with 100 zeros after it, commonly known as Google. G-O-O-G-O-L. They discovered it was owned. They said, you know what, let's put a friendlier spelling on it. On September 15th, 1997, they registered Google as a website. As their idea grew, so did its hunger for more computing power. Brennan Page quickly began to overwhelm the school's resources. We would start to get complaints from the people who ran the networking facilities saying, this one machine in your department is using up half of our networking capacity. One day, they even caused the entire Stanford University network to crash. In 1998, it was clearly time for Google to graduate. With their degrees nearly in hand, Page and Brin dropped out of their PhD programs to focus on attracting funding for their young company. It wouldn't be easy. 
Page and Bryn were engineers at heart, not businessmen. In the late 90s, most tech startups had a simple goal: invent something, sell it to a software giant, and walk away rich. That's exactly what Professor Winograd told Larry Page. My view, which I told him, is well, of course you'll make it work really well, and then you'll sell it out to Microsoft or some big company and make a nice little chunk of change. Potential investor Ram Sharam was skeptical. There were five search engines at the time, and so I said maybe any one of them might be interested in the technology. The world didn't need a sixth search engine. All the big internet players, including then Yahoo CEO Terry Semel, took a pass. Google just didn't fit into the conventional wisdom of what a website should do, which was to keep users from migrating to another page. Google did the unthinkable. It helped users explore the wider web. Larry Page and Sergey Brin had a different attitude. They said, "We don't want a portal." We want to get the search results to them in a split second. The search engine that would come to change the internet was searching for its own next move, but not for long. So one sunny morning, Larry and Sergey were sitting on the porch of a Stanford professor friend of theirs, and Andy Bechtelsheim, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, pulls up in his sports car, walks up, gets about a ten-minute demo, says. This is fantastic. This is the next big, big thing, and writes a check on the spot for a hundred thousand dollars, made out to Google Inc. Stephen Levy is senior writer of Wired magazine. This is the way things work in Silicon Valley. You know, it, it, it sounds astounding that someone would just write a hundred thousand dollar check and get you going, but you have to realize that there was a. A hidden pedigree to this. They were at Stanford. Their professors had done this before. This is a pretty good bet. We might lose our hundred thousand dollars, but we could win big there. And at the time, we had no company at all, and in fact, we couldn't cash the check. <laughs> um, this, by the way, with no legal documents, you know, none of that. <laughs> and even though they had the seed money, they still needed much more cash. No one was buying into Google. They went back to Ram Sharam. Sharam's response was unexpected. None of them wanted to buy the technology、uh, because they thought it was too brutally efficient, and so that was the aha moment. The aha moment, embracing Google's brutal efficiency, made Sharam decide to invest. They found three other investors, and together we raised enough money to get them off the ground. Enough money was one million dollars, including two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com. Page and Brin incorporated Google on September fourth, nineteen ninety-eight, and they moved into one of those storied garages in Menlo Park. They also hired their first employee, Craig Silverstein, a fellow Stanford grad student. I would joke about, oh, maybe one day we'll like have you know a million dollars in revenue. And Sergey was like a million, no, a billion. Google's fame spread by word of mouth. Big money investors smelled success. They attracted the attention of two well-known Silicon Valley venture capitalists, Michael Moritz of Sequoia Capital and John Doerr of Kleiner Perkins. Both wanted an exclusive deal. Brennan Page said no deal. Normally, hitting the jackpot in venture capital. Is going to one of the really ace firms in Silicon Valley. Ari and Sergey say, "You know what? We like both those guys. We're going to get both of them to be our venture capitalists." They had the presence of mind at their tender age, in their mid twenties, then, to say, "We won't take money from only one venture capitalist. We want to assure that neither one of them has control, so we're going to split it." In June of 1999, Google issued its first press release announcing the investment: 25 million dollars. Later that same month, they made an arrangement with the popular web browser Netscape, which drove traffic to Google. Brin and Page now needed to hire first-rate engineers, people who would meet their exacting standards. Hiring the smartest people in the world is no easy task. Chris Saka is a former Googler. It was one of the most intense hiring processes of any company in the world. I had somewhere between 12 and 15 interviews over just a couple days. 
Those interviews range from really probing to puzzles and riddles. There were a ton of Stanford kids there and a ton of Carnegie Mellon and a ton of MIT. At one point, they bought billboards featuring a web address written as a math equation to attract thousands of responses. So every single employee there had to show their SAT scores, even if you were 50 years old and been years since you went to college. Brennan Page also had clear views on what a workplace should be like, a graduate school atmosphere with perks. When Larry and Sergey used to work in the, in the garage of the house in Menlo Park, they realized that when they took breaks to around the refrigerator, that was a time of inspiration. They created a headquarters they called the Googleplex. Food became a key part of the Google experience. When I left Google in 2007, there were 600 chefs across 17 cafes serving almost all organic cuisine sourced mostly, mostly from local providers here. There were these long tables that forced you to sit next to people you didn't know from the company. They were challenging your thoughts, giving you new ideas. These new ideas included what would soon become Google's informal motto, a kind of mantra that expressed its philosophy and its guiding principle, don't be evil. And the Google culture was good for business. It's family services, rooms for nursing mothers, massages. What they've done with that is created a reason for people not to leave. And so they come to the work early and they'll stay late. It's been very easy for Google, the company, to attract the best and brightest engineers because who w wouldn't fall in love with free food and folks playing volleyball at lunch? On the upside, the staff and space grew. But there was a downside. Google still wasn't making money. In Silicon Valley, eyeballs come first, money comes later. If someone has a great idea, there is an article of faith that if you build it, they will come. Larry would come in and I would say, well, how are you going to make money from this? And he would sort of give this little smile and say, well, we'll figure that out. In 1999, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were two 26-year-old Silicon Valley founders who employed more than 40 employees in their first Googleplex. Getting around was easy, but making money was not. Page and Brin had yet to find a way to turn a profit, and they didn't like the idea of using advertising to cash in. At first, they thought advertising was grubby, commercial, kind of unseemly. Their famously sparse homepage was originally designed by Sergey Brin. It focused on the user experience and was built for speed. A lot of people praise uh, Larry and Sergey for the brilliant minimalism of the web page. But really they did it. They didn't have any designers. And they wanted it to load fast. That really dictated something really simple, fast, clean, get in, get out. Unlike rivals Yahoo and AOL, Page and Brin refused to clutter their homepage with ads. We won't take any ads on the homepage because we think to build user trust, we want to not feel like we're bogging them down with advertisements. Danny Sullivan is editor-in-chief of SearchEngineLand.com. I think it was more their commitment to just search quality in general. They wanted to build you know, the world's greatest search engine. And they did have, you know, really strong principles. We, we want to do this. We're not going to sell out. Yet no ads at all meant no revenue. Page and Brin had to accept advertising as their only option, a cold business decision that challenged their utopian vision of the user experience. Any original idea for doing Google, they really didn't have any notion of advertising. In fact, they were very opposed to search engines which promoted things because they were paid. There were search engines in the early days which, when you went to a page, the first few things, which looked just like regular search results, happened to be things that the sponsors of those had paid the search engine to put there. And they said, that's not good for users. I don't want the things that somebody else wants me to see. I want the things that I want to see. Then they found a compromise they could live with. They invented a new way of targeting text ads triggered by search requests. Instead of distracting pop-ups or flashing ads, these small ads were placed above and next to search results. It's familiar now, but revolutionary back then. They called it Google AdWords. 
businesses big and small could take control of their advertising dollars by purchasing ads key to certain words. David Thacker was a project manager on AdWords. Advertisers love the system because they only pay when someone actually clicks on their ad. For many advertisers, it's the most efficient form of marketing they ever have. For businesses, it was the holy grail, a direct connection to their best customers. Ben Schachter is a stock analyst specializing in Google. There's that famous quote that always says, I know 50% of my advertising works, I just don't know which 50%. Yeah. Google tries to make it so that you can know that 50%. Google's system was cheap and precise. It also made people in traditional advertising crazy. Mel Carmazan, the CEO of Viacom, met with Page and Bryn to discuss AdWords. Carmazan was appalled and frightened by that. He said, you are messing with the magic. He said, I don't want my advertisers to know what works and what doesn't. I want to sell them the sizzle. They messed up the idea that um, you had to try to convince advertisers it was all magic. They actually just delivered magic. With a massive new revenue source, Google exploded. Less than two years after its launch, it became the world's largest search engine. By September of 2000, it had indexed a billion URLs and was available in 15 languages. Still, with all of Google's success, few people outside Silicon Valley knew who had created it. Sergey Brin went on to tell the truth. Oh. It's all three of our <laughs> players here claim to be the real Sergey Brin. Number two, what's your co-founder's name? Oh, my tender co-founder. He is uh, Larry Page. We were just <laughs> messing around uh, in graduate school, and uh, we had all these computers. We just played around with them and found that we could uh, develop a better search engine. And fooled the judges. Will O'Real, Sergey Brin, please stand up. <laughs> but media moguls knew exactly who they were. Barry Diller was one of the first traditional media executives to visit Google guys. And Larry is sitting there with his PDA, his little handheld device, and he's looking down and doing his email. And he says, Larry, please, I'm talking to you. Can we just converse? And he says, I can do both. Larry Dillis says, no, you can't do both. Choose. He says, I choose this. And like every choice, the Google founders created a new policy to encourage employee innovation. It was called 20% Time. The idea is for 20% of your time, if you're working at Google, you can do what you think is the best thing to do. And uh, many, many things at Google have come out of that, such as Orkut and also uh, Google News. And News, which I just mentioned, was uh, started by a researcher. And he just, he after 9-11, he got really interested in the news. And he said, why don't I uh, look at the news better. My 20% project was to create a rotating globe that shows where in the world Google users are searching from. That said to people, we don't really, really want you to leave and start your own company. You can do so here. Go ahead and start something new or contribute to somebody else's project. But those presentations had to measure up to some demanding standards. They hate slow products. So if you're giving a demo of a new product to them and it's too slow, Larry will start humming the theme to uh, Jeopardy while they're waiting for the product to load. The exploding speed of projects and ideas was putting enormous pressure on the co-founders. The venture capitalists were saying, guys, Google is growing. We need to recruit a CEO, a professional manager. With tremendous growth came other challenging issues for the search giant Google. The venture capitalists behind the company, Michael Moritz and John Doerr, were pressuring its co-founders to hire a CEO. They were resistant, but they didn't want to say, you know, we could do it. But they thought they could do it. They went through 12, 13, 14 interviews. They didn't like any of the people they, they saw. They visited Steve Jobs just to meet him because he was a hero of theirs. And they said to John Doerr after the meeting, why can't he be our CEO? And of course, he's going to leave Apple to do that. John Doerr, one of Google's venture capitalists, introduced Page and Brin to Eric Schmidt. At first glance, the older Schmidt seemed an odd fit for a young company where employees played volleyball and moved around on scooters and rollerblades. But Schmidt was a businessman with an engineering background, a two-for-one package. 
Eric had two PhDs and everything. So it, it sort of fit with their mold of getting someone that would be a technologist and not just a, uh, a professional business person. You just hired Eric Schmidt. He's come over to run Google. Yes, basically. So what, what's the idea behind that? Um, I mean, you guys couldn't run it yourself? Yeah, uh, parental supervision, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> you know, our search engine really serves the world. We perform over 100 million searches a day. Right. It's really important to people. Um, we have a big company, uh, 200 employees. Yeah. It's a large responsibility, and if you can bring in um, experience to help out, I mean, I think that's pretty reasonable. Of course it makes sense. Eric is a grown-up. In, in the room. I mean, he's he's in his mid fifties, not mid thirties. He's got a lot of experience. He's more of a diplomat than they are, and that's needed in dealing with the traditional media world, which they increasingly are bumping up against. Page and Bryn were sold, especially when they learned Schmidt had gone to Burning Man, the counterculture arts festival in the Nevada desert. The greatest highlight of my of my personal and professional life, I think, is the collaboration that I have with these two extraordinary people. By the end of 2001, Eric Schmidt was Google CEO. Page became president of products, and Bryn the president of technology. The two founders still shared an office. They have a mind meld. They anticipate each other's words. They back each other up. There's no sense of tension between them. That's one of the great strengths of that company. With Eric Schmidt in place, Google kept up its spectacular growth, while its rivals slowly faded away. The search engine linked to three billion web pages and forged a partnership with AOL, which brought them 34 million new customers. You had this incredibly profitable company. How are you going to get it to the next level? How are you going to provide the kind of capital growth that they needed. They were very hungry for more infrastructure, for more employees to get into new lines of business. The solution? It was time for Google to go public. Well, I think when we reached a certain size and scale, and I think there is a 500 shareholder limit uh, under the SEC rules, we also, you know, it's kind of like hiding an elephant in a haystack. Uh, there was there was no point in st trying to stay private at that point. So there was a lot of pressure on the company to do it. Again, Page and Bryn challenged convention, this time by refusing to let Wall Street decide Google's IPO price. Being unconventional, they decided that they were going to hold an IPO unlike any that Wall Street had ever seen. They were going to set the price via an auction to determine and try to extract their greatest value from the stock. They made one mistake during the filing process by sharing a little too much. They gave an interview to Playboy magazine several months before the IPO date, but within the quiet period that the SEC doesn't like any company owners to be talking, and talked a little bit too much for the SEC's liking creating a situation where you had a bunch of SEC lawyers and accountants poring over an issue of Playboy to determine whether they had broken any security laws. The SEC let them proceed, and the auction for Google shares made history. When the day of the initial public offering arrived, Larry Page was at the NASDAQ headquarters in New York, striking the gavel. People were, were sort of confused about who these guys were, but it wasn't until we saw the actual numbers that people said, wow. The stock price on August 19, 2004, closed at just over $100 a share, making the company worth more than $23 billion. Analysts now think they could have made even more. What ended up happening was the price at which it was offered was a lot lower than what the market would have paid for for the stock so the company could have raised more money at a higher price uh, with the same number of shares than it did even so the IPO minted close to 1,000 millionaires the two founders became billionaires they had reached the financial big leagues in six years they predicted that it would take 300 years to complete their mission of organizing the world's information. They're just engineers. And engineers often lack emotional intelligence, which is to say understanding how the rest of the world thinks and works.
Sergey Brin and Larry Page were running a six billion dollar company that now included Google Maps, Google News, and Google Earth. Their idealism and bold ideas had built their reputation, but the company was stumbling with their free email service. Gmail was a great product that was really poorly launched. When users saw ads pop up that were directly related to their personal emails, alarms went off. When people first saw these ads, they were shocked because they thought, "How could these ads be so targeted?" You know, I'm reading this this email about、uh, you know my friend's vacation to Hawaii, and I'm getting ads about Hawaii. Is somebody snooping into my email? According to well-known journalist Ken Auletta, author of Googled, the misstep was a result of an engineer's mentality. These two guys, they're good at things they can measure. They can quantify how many people do a search. They can quantify how many people clicked on an ad. Right? They can't easily quantify people's fears. The concern around Gmail launched a much deeper, fundamental argument about privacy and trust. Do you know how Google's using all the information it collects on you? All of the web searches that I've done for years and years, all of the emails that I've done, potentially information about health records. Information about the books that I'm looking at. Information about where I'm going because I'm typing it into Google Maps. In a sense, they're the big brother that we've been talking about all these years. The ultimate big brother was about to put their "don't be evil" philosophy to the test. In 2006, Google reached an agreement with China for access to their 400 million web users, with one condition: they censor search results of banned topics. For Brin, son of Russian immigrants, it was a troubling decision. His family had faced communist censorship before they fled the Soviet Union 27 years earlier. Chris Saka remembers Sergey's concerns firsthand. At Google's Friday meeting, Sergey spoke with passion about growing up in the Soviet Union and how his parents literally escaped the Soviet Union to come to America and what that meant to him. And that dialogue happened, including everybody, including three. Very rich people on stage who didn't need to engage in this kind of debate, but they showed that the decision hadn't been made. They wanted to hear from all the employees there. Sergey swallowed hard, but they all said at Google, "This is the biggest consumer market in the world. We have to be here." Google agreed to Chinese demands. I know there was a lot of controversy surrounding that, and we had to self-censor、uh, uh, a fair amount. But we were actually able to censor less and less, and our local competitors there also censor less and less. So I feel like our entry made a big difference.、Uh, but things、uh, started going downhill. Google discovered a cyber attack on their systems. The more troubling thing to me is that we discovered the motivation. Uh, which we believed to be to gain access to Gmail accounts, in particular for Chinese human rights activists. Google pulled the plug and redirected users to an unfiltered site in Hong Kong. But Google wasn't going to miss out on serving the world's largest internet market. After tense negotiations with the Chinese, Google's license was renewed. Sergey Brin later admitted that launching the censored site was a mistake. He has made no further public comment. Not a word since Google renewed its agreement with China in July of 2010. Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. <laughs> Leave Britney Spears alone right now. YouTube began as a place for people to share home videos. It soon grew into one of the world's top search engines. When YouTube began, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were already busy with a competing video site of their own, but their upload process for user-generated video was slow. Sanjay Raman was a project manager on Google Video. It took sometimes up to a day for a, a video to be uploaded to our site and actually have it live and playable. And you know, YouTube had a different user experience, which you'd argue was much better, in that you could upload a piece of content, and it would instantly be available and playable on their site. By July 2006, users were uploading 65,000 videos a day to YouTube, and Google wanted in. 
Google understanding that video as a media was going to be a dominant form of content online. They can't do it all. Um, they, everything that they touch does not turn to gold. And sometimes if they want to be successful, they actually have to go out and buy and acquire it from someone else. Page and Brin did just that. They went out and acquired YouTube for $1.65 billion in Google stock. YouTube founders Chad Hurley and Steve Chen were thrilled. Today we have some exciting news for you. We've been acquired by Google. Yeah, thanks. YouTube now gets more than 2 billion hits a day, nearly twice the primetime audience of all three major networks combined. An even bigger audience was starting to carry small screens in their pockets. In 2006, Google CEO Eric Schmidt acknowledged that to stay competitive, the company also had to enter the world of mobile phones. In fact, a year earlier, they had quietly bought another startup, Android, a small company with software for cell phones. There are so many more mobile phones than personal computers. As people do more and more searches on mobile phones, it should eventually balance out. Again, this would be many years. It didn't take years. Apple's phenomenal success with the iPhone in 2007 set a collision course between the two companies. Hey guys, very excited to be here today. Months later, Brin and Page announced their Android operating system would run on a variety of mobile phones. Their longtime idol, Steve Jobs, slammed Google for entering the phone business and accused them of trying to kill the iPhone. Ken Oletta says they had no choice. To assure that all their applications were open on those devices, they had to be in the device business themselves. Google CEO Eric Schmidt, who had been on Apple's board for nearly three years, resigned. What it's shaping up to be is Apple versus Google, and that's not what anyone would have expected, you know, just maybe a year or two years ago. At the Google Developer Conference in May of 2010, Google's vice president of engineering tore into Apple. If Google did not act, we faced a draconian future. A future where one man, one company, one device, one carrier would be our only choice. That's a future we don't want. By fall 2010, Google claims that there were as many as 250,000 activations of Android devices a day. And Google is battling with another giant in the tech world. They bump up against Microsoft in so many ways. They have a browser, Chrome. Microsoft has Internet Explorer. Google also acquired companies that dealt with online versions of word processing software and spreadsheets, things that directly go after Microsoft's jugular with their Office product. Microsoft fired back with its own search engine, Bing, which debuted in spring of 2009. Can I ask what you make of Bing? Do you like it? Um, <laughs> I think, uh... You a Bing user? Uh, oh, yeah. No, no, I, 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 use, I use all search engines out there. Uh, I think that what Bing has reminded us uh, uh, is that the search is a very competitive market. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Bing ironically offered Google protection by letting them dodge accusations of being a monopoly. Bill Gates said this is the company that is closest to us as a competitor. They are just as hungry and as ruthless, you didn't use that word, but I am, as we are. There is a danger. They make a lot of enemies. It's a blind spot because these two founders really think of themselves as noblemen. They think that what they're doing is good for the world. They've always enjoyed feeling like the underdog feeling like the evil empire was Microsoft. And now they've discovered that some people think they're the evil empire. Critics were piling on, calling Google just another self-interested giant corporation. Their own slogan, do no evil, was suddenly being used against them. The list of their critics grew, this time in the publishing world, when they began to scan every book to make them available online. But there was one enormous problem. Did they think to ask permission of the authors and publishers who publish those books? There's a copyright law in this country, and they didn't. Ken Oletta, himself the author of 11 books, took them directly to task at a visit to Google headquarters in 2009. You are full of the idealism and the 
kind of sense that, you know, we don't do evil. But you also are a giant, powerful company, uh, which, are, which is bumping up against issues that really matter to people, like copyright and privacy and power, concentration of power. And people really advertise the worried you have too much power. The protests caught the Google founders off guard. I'm surprised at the amount of resistance uh, that's had, uh, but ultimately I'm optimistic that we're going to be successful, and I'm optimistic that uh, we're going to be able to provide people access to tens of millions of books uh, that otherwise would be lost. Google's quest on the road to organize the world's information took a new turn. Call it a detour with an ambitious feature they called Street View, an attempt to photograph every neighborhood on the planet. Imagine the formidable task and what it would take to pull off. Page and Bryn launched a fleet of camera-equipped cars onto the world's streets. It would eventually include ordinary images from Main Street to extraordinary views of Antarctica. But the effort also took private user information from unsecured Wi-Fi locations. Many people felt their privacy had been compromised. Google acknowledged the mistake and agreed to destroy data. The company known for search was struggling to diversify beyond its core business, and for good reason. Ben Schachter is a stock analyst specializing in Google. The fact that we're still talking about a company where 95% plus of the revenue comes from advertising certainly is a problem. There's really not um, uh, a switching cost for users to move away from Google. If, if uh, two other guys came up with a, a new idea in their garage, people could move away quickly. For Page and Bryn, the biggest competition may not come from two guys, but one guy, this guy, Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg's Facebook is threatening Google's core business. Its 500 million users spend more time on the social network, posting valuable information that is invisible to Google's search engine, information that all advertisers chase. So far, Google's efforts at social networking have failed. But its founders are keenly aware that as users' habits on the web change, Google will have to make a lot more friends. In the space of a year, Larry Page and Sergey Brin both got married. Page married Stanford Bioinformatics PhD Lucinda Southworth in December 2007 on Richard Branson's island. Branson was also his best man. Brin married biotech specialist Ann Wojcicki in the Bahamas with his partner Larry Page standing up for him. They now both have sons. Just a year after they married, Bryn found out he was facing a difficult personal challenge. He had inherited a gene that indicates a predisposition for Parkinson's disease and in his first personal blog announced it on the web. Thomas Goetz is the executive editor of Wired magazine. He took a, a very kind of um, open approach and he wrote a blog post about it. He posted a, a kind of beautiful essay about um, how he learned that he had this risk and what he was doing about it, uh, both in terms of personal behavior and in terms of um, funding for research. I discovered that I carried this uh, one mutation, which is uh, probably one of the best-known Parkinson's mutations, uh, uh, which is in the LARC2 gene. It's one of these rare genes, and it's, you know, obviously that means that I care about it, and, uh, and I also care about it because my mother carries it, and the reason I even looked in that part of the genome was because she... She has Parkinson's. Faced with few medical options, Sergey joined the battle against Parkinson's by applying computer science algorithms to medical research. When you think about the way scientific research is done right now, the traditional route is you come up with a hypothesis, you get your research funding, you gather your subjects. It's a long, drawn-out process. What Sergey realized was that you can use the power of uh, higher processing speed and, and computer storage and basically shrink that time. You can get a group of thousands of people together uh, and, and have the data just kind of sitting there ready to turn through uh, and look for kind of whatever patterns might emerge. It's a very, it's a very googly way of thinking about science. Bryn took the unusual step of making public his own DNA information and has given millions of dollars to Parkinson's research. The company is also generous. 
Google.org, its philanthropic arm, has contributed over $100 million in grants and investments to various organizations from clean energy to global health. And Google continues to plow new ground. One of the company's latest ventures is Google TV. If the web is so smart and our TVs are so fun to watch, why do we have to choose? Why can't they work together? Well, now they can. Introducing Google TV. Using their Android operating system, Google TV is a bold attempt to deliver online video content to the home television set. It may be possible that people will spend as much time or more watching something other than television on their televisions. The, the opportunities that you demonstrated uh, are just mind-boggling. I mean, it's, it's essentially evolving all the time. It's upgradable all the time. The more you, found out about the, the, you find out about the Internet, the more entertainment you find for yourself. In 10 years, Google has grown from startup to technology giant, generating $29 billion in sales in 2010. In a startling Silicon Valley shakeup, Eric Schmidt announced in January 2011 that Google was simplifying their management structure and that Larry Page was ready to lead and would take over from him as CEO. Co-founder Sergey Brin will focus on new products. Schmidt tweeted, Day-to-day -day adult supervision no longer needed. Larry Page and Sergey Brin have changed the way we get information. They are two very determined, innovative, rule-breaking Stanford grad school dropouts. Two game changers. It's been a, a, a great experience for me to see them grow over the last uh, 12 years that I've known them. Uh, I, I feel extremely proud of what they've accomplished. Uh, I'm happy to see them both with uh, families and, and, and little babies. It's another phase in their lives. They continue to be deeply engaged in the business of Google, and that's good to see as well. Larry and Sergey always had this kind of irreverence as part of their attitude, which is what made them so creative. It's great. I think Google attracts people who care, who care about users, who care about their fellow human, who care about the planet, and just can't sit still. They built a company that absolutely changed the world.